I'm Roseanne Ullman. We are up to the 1960s in the series I'm reading about the history of the beauty salon industry. This is, it was published in Modern Salon in 1999. We are now um, at the 100th anniversary of Modern Salon, which is why I'm doing this. I hope you enjoy it. The 1960s, always modern. Sock it to me. The 60s shake up traditions in beauty and business. For having the reputation of being the most identifiable decade of the millennium, the 1960s at closer examination reveal a kaleidoscope of personalities. They weren't simply 10 psychedelically whimsical years of Peter Max drawings, bell bottoms, and geometric hair, but neither were they teeming only with flag burnings, racial unrest, and sit-ins. America had grown wealthy and increasingly conservative as its citizens reaped the benefits of fat paychecks in a land of plenty. But the enormous war baby population coming of age during the 60s sought to put its stamp on the decade. They would be different from any generation that came before them, and they would rebel against not only the Vietnam War, but virtually everything status quo. Serious business. The beauty salon industry was caught in the middle. On the one hand, the industry had matured to a point that it represented big business as much as any other thriving American industry. A groundbreaking for a new manufacturing plant would attract not only the city's mayor, but often the appropriate U.S. senator or representative as well. Regulatory legislation, once a welcomed way to heighten standards for both salons and manufacturers, turned antagonistic as overzealous lawmakers citing toxicity sought to take 85% of hair dyes off the market and renew an old attempt to ban a specific eyebrow tint. But it wasn't only big companies that faced off with the government. Workers too got fed up with the feds when the IRS levied taxes on their last remaining and most cherished freebie, tips. Do your own thing. On the other hand, creativity in salon services, particularly hairstyling, found a home at the heart of the wild 60s, fueled by the vast try-anything youth. If you'd blink, you'd miss a trend. The tall hair, huge cheek curls, and heavy bangs of the early 1960s gave way to little cap hairdos with bangs that dragged to the side and all sorts of sideburn looks. Toward the end of the decade, volume shifted to the back of the head. The gamine became a sort of second bob, serving as a standard but versatile cut with endless variations. Salon decor covered the world's various historical eras. It became necessary to choose furnishings of a distinguishable style, early American, French provincial, modern Mediterranean, Italian Renaissance, contemporary Scandinavian, Spanish, and so forth. But which one owners went with was left entirely to their taste. The 1960s birthed the first family of designer royalty, whose names we still revere, Givenchy, Saint Laurent, Chanel, Dior, Richie, Balenciaga, Cardin, Cassini, Blas, Bean. Fashion was sometimes shocking, but always fickle. Everyone was flat-chested. Then busts were back. Hemlines rose within sight of matching outer underwear. Then they dropped to maxi length. Waist disappeared in true A-line form. Then belts of everything from leather to knits to change cinched them back in. Eyes were heavily shadowed and matched the mascara. Then makeup went pale with shades like nude and beige. By its end, this one decade had paraded down the runways a dizzying procession of everything that had come before in clothing, hair, and makeup, and pretty much everything we've seen since. With the rules up in smoke and new ideas up for grabs, the salon became a testing laboratory for anything you could think of doing with beauty services. What coif goes best with a mini skirt and fishnet knee highs? What hair color complements a see-through vinyl dress? Do you streak the hair and shimmer the lips when you switch to metallic knits? Is there someone on staff to show clients how to attach false lower lashes one by one, properly spaced? There was something for everyone. Women became one person art shows by surrendering to the 60s mantra, do your own thing. With each salon client a canvas, stylists were almost dared to become artists, and this was the decade that many of them did. Some contracted with manufacturers to demonstrate their lines on platform at dealer shows and to travel throughout the country to provide in-salon education. Others used their name recognition to open cosmetology schools. Hairdressers often first spread their wings by entering the new long list of competitions sponsored by trade shows, which were in full swing year-round and breaking attendance records. 
Many hopefuls competed each year for the few precious spots on the USA team, which began entering the World Cup hairdressing championships in 1960. Through these channels, hair designers followed celebrity paths, but generally more in the shadows and with one little sticking point named Sassoon, the Brit who broke the rules. Vidal Sassoon, arguably the most prominent hairdresser in the industry's 75 year history, sliced himself a piece of immortality with nothing but a pair of scissors. His timing was perfect. The photogenic suit clad hairdresser burst onto the British hair scene just as backstreet Brit Twiggy batted her eyes down the world's runways. And from Liverpool, the Beatles led the British invasion toward a new chapter in rock music. Suddenly, everything English was hip. While American hairdressers enjoyed the shinier image they caught in the glow of Sassoon's star status, they also found him a tough act to emulate. Not everyone could swing shears like Sassoon. In addition, the average salon owner found herself at odds with the Sassoon philosophy. If the style was in the cut, where did that leave the profits? Cutting had never brought in half the money generated by perming, coloring, and the weekly wash and set. From owner's vantage point in small town USA, this British guy was way off base. He should be showing curly, wearable styles and harnessing his celebrity power toward pushing perms. Later in the decade he did, but with a sassoon spin, his perms were tousled, baby waves, finger dried. Curl loosens, color climbs. The perm battle would be fought throughout the decade. Perms peaked in 1961, accounting for 35% of total salon volume. In America, Sassoon's geometrics probably posed less of a threat than the perm wave's own success, as the perm became another casualty of the decade's pervasive generation gap. Those curls that in past years stayed so nice and tight for so long, these 60s kids wouldn't have anything to do with them. Although long, straight, and somewhat unkempt hair began showing up on the pages of women's journals and fashion magazines, there still were lots of wavy styles, short and long, that young women wanted to wear. They just didn't trust their mother's tight perm to give them brushable, soft, loose waves. The perm also suffered from the success of other services. The weight from color provided enough support to some types of hair to eliminate the need for a perm. In addition, conditioning services became more standard. Improvements in conditioners and finishing products offered more control over hard to manage hair, again in some cases making perms less crucial. While perms floundered, color continued the upward spiral begun in the 50s. Color appealed to all ages and products were better than ever. Formulated with less toxic chemicals and able to produce a full spectrum of hues that were richer, deeper, and more natural looking. Temporary and semi-permanent color gained acceptance as, again, younger clients sought to separate themselves from the established market. They had fun with color by embracing glazing, tipping, frosting, reverse frosting, dimensional shading, gilting, and minking. Fantastic fakes. Meanwhile, a whole new profit center that emerged in wigs, hair pieces, and falls showed how diametrically opposed 60s styles could be. The ultimate in false hair coexisted with a growing natural trend. Although salons weren't the first to enter the hair goods arena, they hopped to it pretty quickly when they saw department stores encroaching upon their turf. Clients began bringing their store-bought wigs and hair pieces to their hairdressers, an obvious choice for wig servicing. As long as salons were styling hair goods, they might as well be selling them. In fact, wigs were the catalyst for some salons to open their first retail department, since they also had to carry wig boxes, wig spray, wig brushes, and other accoutrements. At first, the most wearable hair goods were stitched from all human hair. Later in the decade, new types of synthetic hair provided a natural looking alternative for a fraction of the price. Because of the difference in price, some salon owners chose not to carry synthetic hair wigs, but many carried both types and found the market for each. Stylists seek R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Pricing hair goods was a lot easier than pricing services. By the 1960s, an annual inflation of 3 to 5% was accepted as a fact of life. In order to keep pace with their rising expenses and provide their staffs with a true living wage, salons were forced to raise prices past the point that many were comfortable. Others just got by afraid to raise prices much at all. Much of the reluctance was still wrapped up in the hairdresser's self-image. Were they trained professionals like doctors and lawyers who didn't think twice about hiking fees? Were they skilled tradespeople like plumbers and electricians who likewise charged what the market could bear? Or were they in some separate category of hourly or commissioned worker whose services were valued only as long as the salon down the street didn't offer the same service cheaper? 
This struggle with their image, which had plagued cosmetologists for years, created a gulf between beauty professionals who had a positive professional self-image and those who continued with their 1950s ways, using older techniques, still disregarding manufacturers' directions and treating the product distributor as just a salesperson. But the owner who took creative as well as business risks set the tone for modern salon management and, in the process, transferred to the stylist some of the responsibility for increasing their own income. They raised prices, installed the latest equipment, implemented cutting-edge techniques, carried multiple retail lines, served clients refreshments, sent their staffs for continuing education, accepted credit cards or extended salon credit to regular clients, purchased second salons and partnered with their dealers. For these forward-looking owners, the 60s held much promise. Once again, the beauty business proved recession-proof as the decade's financial pendulum swung back and forth. Once again, women demonstrated that they would pay for quality and top service. And that was the 60s. Each decade is so interesting, isn't it? Next will be the 70s. Stick with Mom and Salon and me. Thanks.